Welcome to Audio Drama Interviews, the only show without a pithy tagline from Audio Drama Reviews. Then again, it doesn't need one. Hello and welcome to Audio Drama Interviews, the episode or the show where we interview creators in the audio drama space. Today we have Ed Joet, the founder and head writer, I guess, of uh, Shades of Vengeance. So, Ed, tell us a little bit about yourself and the world. Hi, Mike. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, it's fantastic to be here. Um, the, the world itself started because I created a tabletop role-playing game called Era the Consortium. And I should say, I've been a sci-fi fan for my entire life. I absolutely love it. I, I love writing worlds within these, uh, you know, within this universe, sort of building up the entire picture, as it were. And the role-playing game is fantastic for certain aspects of that. I was able to introduce alien races. I was able to sort of give the framework of the story of the universe. But a role-playing game sort of requires that you don't fill in every gap, every single little detail. You know, people need to have flexibility within the bounds of what exists within that universe. So with A Titan's Rise and the comics that I've created and the uh, the other audio dramas in the Consortium universe, what I'm trying to do is sort of fill in a few different gaps. I view each sort of media as opening a window into this universe. So the role-playing game opened, sort of opened a door, if you like. It lets you sort of walk in and play around and, and do what you'd like to do. Whereas a comic or an audio drama, they open a window that lets you see in and see this specific thing in a lot of detail. And that's that's kind of why this universe exists, because of the role-playing game in the first place. But I consider myself a, a world builder, a universe creator, rather than necessarily a, a game creator or an audio drama creator or a writer of novels or any of the other media that I've done for this universe. It's all about expressing the universe in the ways that are unique to that particular media type. So with an audio drama, you can give a lot more of how the universe feels to live in it in a way that you really can't do with even with a comic. You sort of you get some with a novel, but you get a different aspect of it. You don't get so much of the sort of the, the, the general ambiance because everything's going on or, or events are happening with a novel. And with a role-playing game, you know, while you're actually playing, you're obviously focused mostly on the action. So yeah, you get some of the feel, but you don't get that whole overall, this feel is always there in the background. Okay. And it's, it's interesting to me because most people would think you'd start with a story first and then go, then go into tabletop role-playing, I guess. But you the opposite, sort of. I think, I think the thing is that when I built Era the Consortium, what I did is I built a world where any story could happen. And then, to me, it's only natural to tell stories within that world. You know, obviously, as I've said, my, my initial start was, was in role-playing games. And role-playing games is fundamentally about telling your story in that universe. So when you build a universe that allows for any story... Why not tell every story that you'd like to tell within that universe? As long as it fits within it, I don't see why there should be any limitation. You talked about some different worlds in the universe, and I wonder if you could describe how different and similar they are to each other in terms of this world. Like, what are the key product lines you mentioned? So, I should probably begin by saying that I'm relatively prolific. In the last six years, I've published 87 books, comics, card games, and audio dramas. So there's quite a lot to unpack and talk about. Era the Consortium was the first that we created. And as we built it, we initially started with the universe for the role-playing game. And we always knew that we wanted to do more than just that. One of my writers who was involved in Era the Consortium, Jonathan Lewis is very, very into comics, and he wanted to do some comics in our sci-fi universe. So we built a series of comics within the universe, and now we're working on a series of audio dramas because Leo Koch, my co-producer on A Titan's Rise, 
is very into audio. So he said, look, I'd really like to do some stuff within the era of the consortium universe. A Titan's Rise isn't off first within the consortium universe. There's been Declaration and there's also been Radio Free Tyrannus, which is the story of uh, one guy and his microphone broadcasting out about, you know, this cyberpunk universe and how all the corporations are oppressing everyone and the things that the ordinary people should be doing if they really want to fight back against this oppression. A Titan's Rise is a little different to any of those because it's a full cast audio drama. So we've got not a huge cast, but we've got six different voice actors, many of them very, very talented at sort of doing various different accents and, and character voices. And together what we did is we built the story of one of the main characters. So it's a no narration audio drama. The story is entirely told through custom Foley music and the dialogue. And we build sort of the story of Elliot Dragon. We start from when he's just a boy. He's 10 years old and he's separated from his parents. And he goes to, well, he is sent to, to be more accurate, the home world of the consortium, sort of the core of where all of these cyberpunk values, I'll use the term loosely, are observed. You know, all of the companies pretty much run rampant on Tyrannus. There's not much to stop them. And he's sent there because his parents hope that he'll have the opportunity to do anything that he wants in his life. But unfortunately, things don't quite go to plan for him. We cover four periods of his life. So we start with when he's a boy. We go on to when he graduates college. And, you know, he chooses his job and he goes to try and be a starship captain. Star Trek fans would know it as similar to Starfleet. It's smirt your security. It's the, uh, it's the police the military of the of the consortium the the space spaceships and the and also the ground forces as well he goes to the academy he goes through officer training he learns all of the things that he needs to know and he ends up shipping out on a ship as a senior officer when there is one of the most dramatic incidents in the framework that i mentioned earlier of the role playing game because an individual who has a grudge against the consortium turns up with a massive fleet, larger than anything that's really been collected in centuries. And he's bombarding the planet that was originally Elliot's home. And Elliot's ship is one of those that's sent in to try and stop this fleet. So, you know, it sort of starts very small and it sort of grows and grows and grows and becomes more and more this epic journey for our hero who needs to become a certain kind of person but also doesn't want to sacrifice everything that he holds dear to get there what product line so to speak would you not recommend people go to to start with in this world you mean across all of the product lines that i produce so there there are 10 um Shell was learning curve, I guess, so to speak. I don't think that any of them have a learning curve much different to any of the others. Sort of, the way that we tell stories has always been focused around how do we appeal to people who like this genre, right? So if you are a sci-fi fan, go and look up here at the Consortium. It's got everything you could possibly want. If you're more a kind of, oh, I like the zombie apocalypse survival horror kind of thing, go and look up Life on Gaia, our era survival audiobook. That's that's fantastic. It covers all of those kinds of stories within that. If you like superheroes, go and look up Era the Empowered. That's our superhero universe. And, you know, there, there are many more, and I, I could list forever, and I'm, I'm not going to do that. So I don't think that really there's any one world I could point to about the shallower learning curve because really what we did when we created these universes is we tried to make them appeal and work for the people who like a specific genre. So whether you're talking about the tabletop role-playing game and learning the rules and so on, or whether you're talking about getting involved in the audiobooks, the novels, the comics, and the other, other stuff that we have going on, I think that what you should do if you want to get involved is choose the setting that most appeals to you. So if you're a sci-fi fan, I'm a sci-fi fan. I, I love sci-fi. I've been a sci-fi fan my entire life. 
if you're a sci-fi fan, the right place to start is absolutely Era the Consortium. It's got everything you could possibly want within it. It's also sort of the first game that we made, so it's got the most it's got the most books, it's got the most other stuff in the universe, such as audio dramas it's, uh, that I've mentioned earlier. It's got several comics, uh, five in all, and it's got a lot of really powerful story behind it. But if you, let's say you're more, oh, I like the survival horror, Walking Dead, zombie apocalypse type stuff. Well, we've got you covered there. You can go and look up Era Survival, uh, whether that's for the role playing game or again, whether that's for the audiobook called Life on Gaia, which is on Audible and available. If you like, say, superheroes, for example, you could go and look up Era the Empowered and, and our comics and our audio dramas in that universe. So I don't think that there's really a, a different learning curve for any of the any of the universes. I think that the best place to start is where you feel most engaged and you, you would most like to hear a story of this kind. Now, I, I could go on for quite a long time um, because we have got 10 different universes that we actively create content within. How many other creators partake in this world? And how do you handle differences of opinion that artists can have while working in a shared world like this? Yeah, I mean, that's that's always a problem. So one of the things that I mentioned earlier is that every world can tell any story. I am ultimately the sort of the line editor for all of the worlds. But I have one particular writer who excels at doing really horror related stuff. And I've got one particular writer who is much more lighthearted, you know, and, and nearly every story he writes has some kind of element of humor to it. All in all, I want to say there are 11 or 12 writers at this current time, I've not actually sat down and counted, that are working on the era of the Consortium universe. But the power of doing it in the direction that I was saying, and, and you were saying is maybe a little more unusual, is that they can tell a story of their style in their section of the universe without it affecting other things, without it making everything else seem wrong. It's one of the wonderful things about having the scope to play in. So what, what happens is I will go to a writer, I'll say, hey, look, I'd like to do a project, as I did with Radio Free Tyrannus, or indeed A Titan's Rise. I went to a writer and I said, hey, I've got this idea. Let's do this project. I don't want to write it alone. Let's do it together. In the case of A Titan's Rise, that was with Leo. And Leo said, okay, yeah, let's do that. We decided we built up the story based on the things that we already knew existed, and we fleshed out all of the sort of the aspects of the universe. And we built on a number of stories that already existed that have been written by the wonderful Amy Allwarden. Um, who's been working with me since day one of Era the Consortium, pretty much. We we took her stories, we added our own stuff, we dramatized some of her stories, and, and so on. And that led to our own story that followed our own creative lines, but still fit very nicely within the universe because we didn't violate any of the rules that exist. And the rules are relatively loose because, you know, good people exist, bad people exist, my my one criteria for people in the universe is that they are real. No one is entirely good. No one is entirely evil. Everyone has their own motivations, even if they're not visible. And as long as you understand that, and as long as you observe that, I think you can always tell a powerful story, no matter what specifics the universe is. Let's talk about Kickstarter for a second. I assume this is not your first Kickstarter, is that correct? It is not my first Kickstarter, uh, assuming it funds, and sure. things are looking good at this stage. Sure. Um, it will be my 54th funded Kickstarter. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, has your crowdfunding process changed since your first campaign? And any advice for people who start who wish to start one who already have an established brand or audience? Oh, God, yes. Has it changed? Oh, God. Um, yeah, uh, you wouldn't even recognize it from my first campaign. What advice would I give to someone who does not have an established audience? Who, or do, does? who does? Who Sorry, does? I, who does? If you do have an established audience and you know these people will back you, all you really need to do is set up the Kickstarter, make sure it looks good, and make sure that you're not ripping people off. Right? If if you believe that they're going to support you, 
would you buy it at this price if it was not your project? If it was Joe Bloggs and you found it on Kickstarter, would you pay this amount of money for it? That's one of the hardest things to really assess. So one of the really useful things is to pick someone out of your crowd, preferably someone who doesn't know you very well, and go, hey, can you look at my Kickstarter and tell me if you think it's overpriced? Because, or, or indeed underpriced. Because most creators go one way or the other and they don't get it right straight away. The other thing I would say is have an expectation of what your goal should be relative to what other people who are the same as you get. So our established audience is not massive, but they are relatively loyal. And I'm very, very grateful for that. A number of people who are supporting the current A Titan's Rise Kickstarter are sort of people who have backed other Era of the Consortium projects or or even just other audio projects that we've done. And they know nothing about Era of the Consortium, but they like our work. So look around and see what it is that you can offer. Make sure that you're offering something tangible that people want. And be ready for your first Kickstarter to fail. My, my first Kickstarter failed. Um, I learned more from the failure than I have from anything else since. Look carefully at your goal is the other thing that I would advise. Don't assume that every one of your $200 tiers is going to get taken and that means that you'll reach funded. Assume that everyone comes in at the lowest reasonable amount. Do you have 500 people who will back you so you know that if your tier is $3 and your goal is 1500 you will definitely make your goal? Assume the worst case scenario to start with. As you learn more about your audience and the way in which they're willing to support you, you'll begin to see things take shape. Um, the only other thing I would say is don't expect people who back you in other ways, uh, Patreon, Coffee, any of the other ways that people back podcasts, don't expect those people to back you financially again, because it's not reasonable. It's not fair, right? Reward the people who have backed you from day one. Give them something for free, maybe even give them the whole thing for free if they're paying you monthly for a Patreon anyway. Think about that and think about not losing the people who have supported you all of this time because you can alienate people by getting the dollar signs in the eyes, as it were. Definitely. I can definitely see that. That's about all I have for you right now. Is there anything else you want to leave the audience with? I believe in creating stories. I believe in bringing them to life. And for me, A Titan's Rise has been a two-year project. We've gone through a lot of adversity, <laughs> a lot of adversity from our voice capture and editor individual getting ill after the end of uh, after the end of recording and not being able to edit. We found another editor. That person had to leave the country. Her visa ran out, ended up back in South Africa. We have gone through a lot to get this in front of you. So we are ensuring that all of the profit goes to the people who made it happen. And for the most part, that's not me. So, you know, if you're listening to this and thinking, oh, that's another, that's another CEO of a, you know, a company or a person who's, who's arranging things and is going to get all of the money, it, it's not the case. The, it, most of the money is going to the voice actors, to the editor, and to the various other people who made this happen. Because this was my dream. Right. So the fact that I've put my time and money into it, it's not a big deal for me. I'm I you know, I made my dream happen. That's what matters. What I want to make sure of and the reason this project's on Kickstarter is because I want to make sure that the people who gave of their time and money when it wasn't their dream, but they were willing to make it happen, get some kind of, you know, reward, some kind of thank you for doing that. So if you listen to it, if you like it please back the project. We really need your help and we'd really appreciate it. And I know the whole team would appreciate it.